Hello and welcome everyone to the Intrepid Museum's live virtual programming. Thank you so much for joining us today for Celebrations at Sea, where we are going to talk a little bit about how sailors built community at sea and some of the amazing things that they celebrated while they were out in the ocean for six to nine months at a time. So hello, my name is Alicia, and I am an educator at the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum in New York City. I'm going to be your host today. And just as a reminder, the museum's live streams are free. And if you'd like to support us in delivering these programs, I invite you to check out the links in the comments or in the descriptions below. So feel free to use the chat today to say hello. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Let us know if you've ever been to the Intrepid Museum before. And of course, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat as well. So once again, my name is Alicia. I'm an educator at the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum, where our mission is to honor our heroes, educate the public, and inspire our youth. And you are now going to get a little bit of a glimpse into some naval culture and cool things that brought to life our ship. So for those of you who may not be familiar, this is the Intrepid Museum. So our complex is located on the west side of Manhattan in the Hudson River. Our museum is housed inside of a historic World War II aircraft carrier, the USS Intrepid. And we also have a historic Cold War submarine, a space shuttle named Enterprise, and a British Airways Concorde there as well. But as you can see in this picture, our ship is really, really big. Our ship is 913 feet long. Now, that is so big that if you stood it up on its end, it would be about as tall as a New York City skyscraper. And it's also so long that it could play or you could play three games of football on top at the very same time. Now, it was constructed way back in 1943 for a very specific purpose. It was made during a time when we were fighting countries all the way across oceans. And we didn't want to have to launch our planes over here in America and then fly them all the way across the water to get over there because, well, you know, that'd take too much fuel, too much time. So we created these aircraft carriers, just like the Intrepid, to help do that. Now, something else that I do like to point out is a little bit about the history of how our ship was made. So the keel of our ship, the very bottom of it, was actually laid in Newport News, Virginia on December 1st, 1941 in preparation for World War II. And then just six days later, as you can probably remember, December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor was attacked, a day that will live in infamy. And of course, that dragged the United States into the conflict and also dragged a number of the male shipyard workers into the war overseas, too. So about 400 women were then called in to temporarily fill some of their positions in the shipyards to keep up with all the wartime needs. And a couple of them, actually, you can see in this photograph right here. All right. So uh, this is a newspaper clipping uh, from its launch, the Intrepid's launch. And their presence, those women there, were felt immediately. This giant Essex-class aircraft carrier, all right, it was estimated to take three years to construct. But thanks to all of the hard work of the women, it ended up taking only 17 months, so just over a year. And the headline of this clipping from the New York Times in 1943 is, Women at Work, They Help Turn Out the Ships of War. And so in many ways, maybe we could say that the very first celebration for the Intrepid, and really any ship, is kind of like a baby shower or a baptism, right? So it's a ceremonial ship launching ceremony. And check this picture out. Well, both of these actually. On April 26, 1943, just prior to its launch, the USS Intrepid underwent this longtime naval tradition to wish it good luck and send it on its way, which included uh, on the right here, you can see Helen Smith Hoover, who was the wife of a Navy admiral. There she is smashing a bottle of champagne against the ship and officially naming it as it was launched. So that's part of the ceremony there. And the other photo on the left shows a gift exchange between her and one of the welders from the shipbuilding yards as well. You'll notice a woman. So our ship was in service from 1943 to 1974, and it later became a museum in 1982 after being saved from the scrapyard, believe it or not. So of course, being a museum now and talking about things like these celebrations and all of this history, we do like to display a lot of very cool things to bring the ship to life. And so we also like to display things like these. Chairs. Yes. Now, I know you might be thinking, what? 
I came here to talk about celebrations. Why are we looking at chairs? Why do we have chairs on display? Well, everyone, these are artifacts. They are important to us, and they can tell us a lot about what life was like on board the ship. Now, if you take a look at them, some of them look pretty common, you know, maybe similar to chairs that you maybe even have in your house or at work or at school. And some of them might look a little more complicated too. But this, everyone, is a wonderful way for us to take a closer look at what people were doing on board a ship like the Intrepid. So we can think about what they were used for based on how they look, maybe if we've seen them somewhere before. And we can also think about where they might have been on our ship too. So everyone, I want you to take a second. I'm gonna make this a little bigger for you here. Take a second and point on the screen or just point with your mind if you wanna look. Which chair do you think is the most boring chair? So which of these looks the most normal, kind of the most boring chair that maybe you've even sat on in, at an office or, or in a school, or maybe you're even sitting on one like it now. So to me, this one, the one on the right here, all the way on the end, looks the most boring and typical. So this is a pretty standard looking office chair. And it tells us that just like on land, people held regular office jobs while they were on board the Intrepid at sea. So not everyone was a pilot or got to lift and lower the anchor. There was plenty of other important paperwork that had to be done too. So that is just one type of job that we might find on board. All right, now I want you to take a look at the screen again. And I want you to point on the screen for me, which chair do you think is the most comfortable? So which of these do you think would be the most comfortable to sit on? Maybe something you can imagine curling up into, it's all soft and cozy. What do you think? So when I look at these, I think it's this brown one in the middle. I think that one looks the most comfortable. In fact, it kind of looks like one of those comfy recliner chairs that you might have in your living room, or maybe even one of those big comfy movie theater seats that you can sit on there. So believe it or not though, these were used specifically for pilots in their ready room. So pilots had one of the most stressful jobs on board the Intrepid. So the ready room was designed to be as comfortable as possible. And here is a picture of the ready room and a bunch of the pilots in their in the ready room there in their seats. And you can kind of think of the ready room as kind of like a classroom where they would learn all about their missions. Now underneath the seats, they had little lockers for their things and even some desks that folded up and over, over their laps to take some notes. And they would sit in these chairs to prepare for their flights. So it was kind of like a school chair but definitely a much more comfortable one because sometimes they were sitting there for a long period of time getting ready to go and launch their planes. Now, after the pilots were in this chair, they got into another chair, this one right here. This one's just to the right of the brown chair there. And does anyone know, what would you call a chair like this? Tell me in the chat if you know what something like this would be called. We are looking at this big, light greenish kind of looking one just to the right of the comfy chair with uh it's got a lot of straps on it it's a little scary looking but i bet those straps and all that padding might have had something to do with what that seat was for anyone know so everyone this is what you would call an ejection chair so you see a long long time ago if something really bad happened to your plane, you actually had to climb out of your cockpit. You had to climb out onto the wing, believe it or not, and then jump off. And hopefully you had your parachute with you and then you'd be able to float down. But as you can imagine, that was super dangerous. And as you can see here, there is an image of uh, an ejection chair being used here. So imagine everyone, if you are on a plane going forward, the tail end of it, when you've got that, that parachute coming down, might get tangled up in your parachute after you jump. So these ejection seats were created where you would pull a handle on the top or on the bottom, and it would shoot you up and away from your plane, much, much further away, very, very fast. And so the plane then could go down, and then you could then very safely float back down to Earth uh, with your parachute and uh, maybe have a softer landing in the water below. Now, of course, if you landed in the ocean, though, sometimes you didn't land near your own ship and another ship had to come pick you up. But all your stuff is still back on the Intrepid. So eventually you're going to have to transfer ships, right? And that is where 
this chair on the end comes in. Now, this big white chair here on the end is something called a highline chair. And it works kind of like a zip line. So there is a cable that would go through the top of the chair. You can see right at the top there, there's a little hole. There's a loop right up there. It's a metal um, loop up there. So the cable would get fed through that. They would connect one end of it to, uh, of course, the ship that you're on, another end of it to the ship that you want to go to. And then they would put you in the chair and zip you right across the line, right over the water to get you back to your ship. And here's a picture of that in action to bring that to life for you a little bit more. There it is right in the center of that picture. So that person is riding across the waves there, holding on for dear life. And they've also got a huge bag of some supplies or some equipment uh, right on their back too, kind of all nestled into this little sort of like a cage, I suppose. And they're going right across the water there. Might be some food in there too. Looks like a wild ride, right? So if you've ever been on a zip line, that is kind of the best way to explain what that's like. And it's very, of course, important that the cable is very tight, very taut going across those two, because if not, and those ships start to come closer, boop, it's going to dunk you right in the water. So we don't want that to happen. Now, everyone, there is one last chair that I haven't mentioned yet, and it is this one right here. So take a look at that chair. Can anyone tell me in the chat maybe what kind of chair this one is? Tell me if you have any idea. What does it kind of look like to you? And of course, keeping in mind that this is kind of old, all right, this was from World War II, but it still functions pretty much the same way as the ones that, that are like it now. Anyone have any guesses what this one might be? Any guesses? Put it in the chat for me if you know. So everyone, this is a dentist chair. Now, why do we have a dentist chair on display at the museum? Well, once again, this is here to remind us that while the Intrepid was traveling all around the world, these men would still be out at sea for six to nine months at a time. And because they were out in the middle of the ocean, they had to take everything with them that they might want to have at home. So that also, of course, included people like dentists and doctors and surgeons in case they got sick or had an emergency. And also barbers, too. You can see in the picture on the right there. So, of course, they could get their hair cut. And all of these community worker positions that we might take for granted, having them, you know, here in our neighborhoods right down the street. But they also had to think about having them there on board with them, too. So again, it's this idea of having a whole city at sea on board the ship with them that was really, really important. So there were a whole variety of jobs. And you can see that dentist chair in the picture on the left there. That guy's getting a cleaning, I suppose, or hopefully he's not having to have any serious operations on board there because that would be oof, very, very uncomfortable, I could imagine. So I want to pause here before we move on and just see, are there any questions about the Intrepid or life on the Intrepid or anything like that? Any questions at all? How many people served on the Intrepid? So there were about 3,000 people that served on board the Intrepid at any given time. Uh, and so again, this idea of the city at sea, the community at sea, everyone had a very, very important specific job. And they all had to work together as one big team. You can imagine it kind of like a, uh, a sports team where everyone has their own job and they all have to work together. Or, um, you know, maybe a, a team like an assembly line, for example, everyone's working together. Everyone had their own jobs that they stuck to and it became a very well-oiled machine and they were able to get things done. And they counted on each other. So they really became a family there. All right. Another question? Did any women serve on the Intrepid? Great. So actually, no. <laughs> no. Throughout its 31 years in service, no women ever served on board. And that is just because that's how things were back then. But I always say, you know, it's impossible to, to pass through the ship's decks without encountering the impact of women in some way. So first of all, many women, as I mentioned, helped to build the Intrepid. Um, so many men, of course, had to go overseas fighting. And so the ship is floating today because of them. And also, of course, you know, we've heard of this term Rosie the Riveter, right? These are the ladies who took on the factory jobs in order to build planes and engines during the war. And uh, many of the planes that flew off of the Intrepid 
were built by these women as well. So um, that was very important. Also, women, for the first time, were able to become test pilots during World War II. Um, Grumman Aircraft out on Long Island had the very first female test pilots. They flew things like uh, Hellcats and Bombers, the Avengers that we have actually too, um, and a lot of fire planes to get them ready for battle. So that was important. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, while no women actually directly served on board, they definitely helped out a lot behind the scenes. And so, uh, you know, of course, we'd be remiss to not to not mention them uh, today and when we're talking about the Intrepid as well. All right, everyone. So this idea of community, right, was really, really important to the sailors because, again, imagine you are out at sea for nine months. You are going to be away from your friends and your family, and you're probably going to miss a lot of holidays and birthdays and things like that that you would normally spend with them as well. Now, within communities, often you can find others who celebrate things like holidays that you and your family might celebrate. So this is holidays like Thanksgiving or, uh, or well, here in America, Thanksgiving or uh, maybe Christmas or Hanukkah or Kwanzaa in December. And, you know, right now we've got Easter and Passover going on and Ramadan coming up. I mean, there's all these holidays that people celebrate uh, within their communities. It's also April Fool's Day today, by the way, guys, too, but I'm not I'm not going to give you any jokes. So they thought it was important to try to recreate that sense of being at home and capture that holiday spirit with things like decorations and traditional foods and really trying to bring to life that joy that we associate with different holidays each year. And while they may not be with the families that they were born into, we could say at the time. They created these new bonds and new families with those that they were serving aboard their ships. So for those of you who are tuning in right now, I would love to hear what are some events that you celebrate at home? Maybe what's your favorite holiday? Maybe do you have a big traditional meal that your family always eats for something? Or uh, maybe you celebrate um, when you hit a milestone, like you have a birthday or an anniversary, or also just like an achievement, like a graduation, right? May is coming up. We're going to have some graduates coming up here, uh, or maybe a new job. So how do you celebrate it? Let us know in the chat. And let us know if maybe also you have celebrated one of these things recently, too, because we would love to celebrate you here as well. So let's talk about some of these celebrations on board the Intrepid, though, to get back to that. So one of the first things that often comes to people's minds when they think of celebrations is food, right? I know I love a big feast or going out for some fancy dinner uh, to celebrate something. Well, year round, something that the Navy has always been known for is really, really good food. Because if you are going to send thousands of young men out to sea for six to nine months at a time, what better way to bribe them than with some good food, right? So the food helped to keep their morale up at all times, but especially during holidays. And the Intrepid in particular was known for some really, really good food. So Intrepid's cooks prepared about seven tons of food every day to feed the hungry crew of over 3,000 men. I mentioned that earlier. And on board, there were two full kitchens called galleys, fully equipped with all the stuff that you might find uh, in a restaurant. They had grills and fryers and ovens. And you can imagine, though, what a very hot and fast paced and exhausting job it would have been to feed all of those ravenous young men on any normal day, let alone during the holidays, too. But typically at mealtimes, crewmen would line up at something called a chow line. So you can see this in uh, the big picture on your screen now. This is from 1967 on the Intrepid. The sailors would take steel trays through a serving line to pick out the food they want. And then that was dished out for about 15 hours a day. They always had food going out. And it would start way before breakfast. And then it would go even after dinner time too. So the men would take their food and they would return to an area called the mess area or the dining area nearby to eat. So you can kind of imagine it just like a big cafeteria that you might have at your school. Very much the same there. Now, the bakers on board also made all sorts of bread and pastries from scratch. And in the bake shop, you can see that picture on the lower right. Groups of three or four sailors would work 12 hour shifts in order to bake all of these yummy baked goods. The night shift would bake up to about 800 loaves of bread. 800, you heard me right. And the day shift would prepare things like desserts. They'd have anything sweet, lots of uh, smaller cakes and pies and uh, cobblers and cookies, you name it. Uh, every single lunch or dinner, they'd have these things. And then also, of course, specialties for the holidays. 
They also had, you know, muffins and cinnamon rolls and all that sort of thing um, for breakfast. But just imagine everyone, if you have ever baked something in a kitchen, let alone 800 things, right? 800 loaves of bread. Imagine how hot it would get with all of those ovens going at the same time. So a lot of really hot and sweaty hard work in the kitchens too. But chow was a time for the sailors to relax and take a break from work. And food was especially important, again, for the morale around the holidays. So the cooks would often plan special meals for Thanksgiving and for Christmas. Uh, and that would, of course, include the traditional holiday favorites that we have at home. Things like turkey and ham and a ton of desserts, of course, to help to pass all of those long hours at sea. Uh, and also to just help them bond and, and hang out and become a more tight-knit team. So... Here in America, everyone, Thanksgiving Day, of course, is a national holiday, and it began as a day of giving thanks for the harvest. So do you celebrate Thanksgiving? What do you eat on Thanksgiving? I think we all know one thing that is very, very common, at least, in Thanksgiving time. So take a look at this menu from Thanksgiving on board the Intrepid. This uh, is a menu from 1945, and they would often print these beautiful commemorative menus that the sailors could keep to remember the day as a souvenir. And so it's got this festive image of a turkey on it, and uh, of course the meal that they had there as well. So take a look at this menu, and tell me in the chat, does your family eat any of these same foods for the holidays? So looking at this here, we've got things like roast turkey and gravy, mashed sweet potatoes, cream of tomato soup, oyster dressing. So it's a lot of the foods that a typical American household might eat on Thanksgiving Day. I know we certainly in my household eat a lot of these things too. So for certain celebrations, we often associate certain foods or we celebrate it in a particular way as kind of a form of tradition or a custom that's handed down from one generation to another. Maybe you've got a family recipe that you've always had in your family and you're going to keep passing that on for generation to generation. And of course, everyone, turkey on Thanksgiving is one of those things for us here in America that it's just what you do. <laughs> and so certainly for those men on board the Intrepid, which was an American aircraft carrier, turkey was something that was essential for that meal. So Another thing that people often associate with the holidays, though, beyond food, are also decorations. All right. So when the ship was first built in the 1940s, it was during World War II, and it was a very, very difficult time, of course. So Christmas was a very important time for the sailors, but there was also a lot of rationing going on at the time. And that means that products that um, didn't, uh, that, you know, had metal or nylon, that sort of thing, they weren't really using them as much because they needed to save them for use in the military. They needed the metal to make things like planes and ships and bullets and uh, the nylon for things like parachutes, right? And stuff like that. So people, both both at home and at sea had to kind of get creative with their decorations around the holidays. And they would often hand make decorations or even whole trees like this picture that you can see here on the left. They would use um, strips of fabric and wire and things like that. And then they also just kind of had to make do with whatever they could find around the ship or their base, uh, which led to them getting pretty creative like you can see in these pictures here. So if you check out this bulletin board, from the Intrepid in 1967, it says, ho, 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 Merry Christmas to all and a Happy New Year. So all around it, there are some decorated paper plates. And then on the right of it, there are some Christmas cards that are put up. And there is drawn around those cards a Santa Claus with a head drawn on the top up there. And it looks like he's wearing a gas mask. So <laughs> kind of a sense of humor there too. Um, but on the bottom, you can also see there is a lovely spread of nuts and fruits for the crew. And there's some festive decorations. They put up some aluminum foil, some tinsel there, uh, and a tree that to me actually looks kind of like it could have possibly been made out of coffee filters. It might not be, but it certainly would be creative if they had done that. Now, in addition to the holidays, though, they also celebrated traditional milestones. All right. So for centuries, sailors have engaged in rituals uh, when their ships have crossed certain markers, such as the equator. Uh, and again, these times were meant to bond the sailors and boost morale. So there is a little bit of a decoration theme going on with this one, too. And you'll see why. So this is what we call 
crossing the line, the line crossing ceremony, and specifically the equator, but it could also be other lines as well. So on January 22nd, 1944, the first crew to serve on the aircraft carrier Intrepid crossed the equator for the very first time. Now, uh, if you don't know what the equator is, that is that line. It is uh, technically zero degrees latitude. It's kind of like the waistband. It's like the belt going around the center of the earth there. You don't see it. It's an imaginary line, but that is the smack dab in the center of uh, the earth. All right. It's that line that goes around it. So crossing the equator means that they, let's say they, let's say they are in New York City. They would be up here and then they would cross that middle line and head down to the Southern Hemisphere. Now, the crew would mark this occasion with something, this time-honored naval tradition called the line crossing ceremony. Now, to take you back a little bit for the history of this, the open seas have been the subject of myths and legends since the beginning of seafaring many, many years ago. And the early sailors would actually pray to Neptune, the god of the sea, in order to ask for protection from monsters and storms and things like that. And then at some point, more than 400 years ago, they say this line crossing ceremony began for sailors which celebrated their transformation from a slimy polywog, which is someone who's never crossed the line of the equator, let's say, to a trusty shellback, also the uh, son or daughter of Neptune, who has now then become a uh, part of this kind of seasoned fraternity of sailors. So it's a way for sailors to be tested for their seaworthiness, kind of, but also really to just have a lot of fun with their friends and have really memorable experience. So here's how this would work, because I know you're looking at these pictures thinking what on earth is happening here. Uh, so it still happens today. First of all, you can see on the lower left is actually a little bit more of a modern picture. Uh, but the day before a ship crosses the equator, King Neptune, who is played by the most veteran sailor, the captain even, would come on board and proclaim his authority and pass judgment on all of the polywogs, the people who haven't crossed the equator yet, who he says have not properly honored him. So this is a very theatrical thing. He also arrives with his court, typically comprised of his queen, often played by a sailor in drag. Also, there's Davy Jones, you might recognize of Davy Jones' locker. Uh, you also have the royal baby and other dignitaries. So he's got this court, and they're all dressed up in these very elaborate costumes. Now, the polywogs, the newbies, have to entertain them all with a talent show. And then the next morning, they have to eat this really gross, unappetizing breakfast. It's usually got a lot of hot sauce in it or it's just something that's very, very not very appetizing. Uh, and then they have to perform a variety of embarrassing and very messy activities. They might have to, you know, roll around in some garbage or, you know, play tug of war. And it's like really difficult. So they have to do all of these really ex embarrassing activities before finally then taking a royal bath in a pool of garbage and then receiving their certificates. Now, there's your certificate. Uh, it declares them to be shellbacks and acknowledges their initiation into the solemn mysteries of the ancient order of the deep. Now, this certificate was actually awarded to a sailor named Louis Gross, who served on board the Intrepid on its very first equator crossing in 1944. But it was just one of the many equator crossings that they celebrated. And of course, today, like I mentioned, they still do this in the Navy. They still actually do it on cruise ships, believe it or not, as well. They'll actually uh, have, you know, the staff come out and even do it to all of the unsuspecting uh people who have uh, paid for a ticket on the cruise. Uh, although it's not quite as gross, I would imagine, if you've paid for a ticket. But uh, the crew commemorated um, this, this wonderful occasion, and this is what has become known now as the line crossing ceremony. But there's other lines, of course. Um, there are other uh, achievement milestones that they also celebrate, too. Circumnavigation around the globe, so going all the way around the globe during the Vietnam War was one of them. They got something called the Order of Magellan, certificate for that. So that's on the bottom, you can see there. Um, other certificates initiate sailors into the order of the Golden Dragon for crossing the international date line towards Asia. Also the Royal Order of the Blue Noses for crossing the Arctic Circle. And also uh, the Royal Domain of the Emperor Penguin for crossing the Antarctic Circle. Um, some of the other fun ones, though, if you were um, on board that aren't really as uh, more commonly known, but if you were on board, you were part of the Goldfish Club for pilots who ditched their planes into the ocean and then had to take a life raft. There's also the Caterpillar Club for anyone who had to bail out of their plane and use a parachute. So 
Of course, the, the silky material of that parachute is kind of like a silkworm, right? Um, and then a member of the commissioning crew of a ship is called a plank owner. So it's the first people who are on it. And um, they also later got an actual plank of the ship when it's later decommissioned. So we've actually given some out to uh, some of the former crewmates of the Intrepid. And uh, in order to qualify for the Royal Order of Whale Bangers, you had to have been aboard a ship when it mistakenly fires at a whale, thinking that it's a submarine. <laughs> so there's a lot of really fun things that they had to keep them entertained because, again, six to nine months at a time. Imagine that kind of like quarantine, right? For six to nine months, you're in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> You got to entertain yourself somehow. <laughs> now, of course, these certificates weren't official Navy awards, but they did really mean a lot to the sailors and the community that was on board the ship. Many sailors, many veterans still have these certificates today and cherish the memories. Um, but but that was really the point of it. They made for great memories and it documented where the sailor had been, you know, around the world or going around the world and uh, what they had accomplished. So I'm going to pause here again and uh, see if there are any more questions. So let me, there we go. All right, any more questions right now? Did they have religious services? Yes, they did. So all year round, actually, uh, but especially during the holidays, too, of course, uh, to help people uh, to keep up with their individual customs and their traditions. Uh, so ships recognized that crewmen, you know, had a variety of faiths. And so they held services uh, that honored many of these traditions at the time. So they'd gather um, sometimes, you know, on the Intrepid's hangar deck. Uh, we have some, some evidence of this in our archives. Um, they'd celebrate a mass on Christmas Eve. And also uh, a number of prayers were printed in those menus, like the Thanksgiving one that I showed you, um, that had a variety of faiths in them as well. Uh, and we also actually have in our archives a Jewish calendar from 1944 that was given out to sailors if, if they wanted it that had Jewish prayers in English and in Hebrew, uh, as well as a listing of some of the services, the veteran services that were available to them that were nearby some of the posts uh, and the bases that they were going to be visiting on land. So it's just a couple of the ways that the crew could you know, practice their personal beliefs while they were away from home and, and definitely be supported uh, by the uh, by the, the crew of the Intrepid as well and, and the other big ships that they were on. Great question. Uh, one more question, maybe? How did they get a Christmas tree on the ship? Right, so, uh, so okay, yes, yeah, so there was that picture of the tree with the, the stuff hanging off it, right? So, yeah, during World War II and the Vietnam War, um, you know, they, they would, well, always really, they were out in the ocean, so they couldn't really get a tree on there. They couldn't really grow a tree or anything, and that would be kind of silly to just bring a tree on for that. Um, but they were often also stationed in tropical climates. So even um, if they were on land, they wouldn't necessarily have access to things like Christmas trees and pine trees like we usually have. So instead, they would decorate things like palm trees. Uh, and uh, if they were at sea, they would even, you know, make their own makeshift trees out of, you know, like the, the picture that you saw, things like pipes and hoses. And um, I, I've seen uh, an image where they actually hung all sorts of stuff like uh, paint can lids on it and um, uh, bullet casings and gas pumps and stuff like that. So they kind of create their own little tree. Um, and I also know that they actually used surgical cotton. So of course there were, you know, doctors on board, they would use surgical cotton to make it look like snow. So kind of like actually what people do at home. So you, know, so you have the, the fluffy white cotton stuff. Um, and then tinsel, this is my favorite story to tell. Tinsel became very popular during World War II because uh, it was made from these silver, these thin silver foil strips. That actually started where people like overseas in Europe, they would drop these these sheets of these very thin sheets of uh, foil to confuse radar signals. So people would actually go out, you know, they do it in the fields and stuff and the people would go out into the fields and start collecting up all of this random just like, you know, silver foil stuff out of their lawns um and they would use it to decorate instead and that tradition has actually really stuck around because when you hang those little strips of you know silver foil um from from your tree it kind of looks like icicles right it's very like sparkly and magical looking so um they got creative and uh at the time too again i mentioned rationing world war ii they didn't have as many ornaments they didn't have as many you know metal balls and things that they could hang uh so their trees were a little sparse but that helped to fill in some of the holes there. So that's actually a wartime tradition that got started. Uh, but yeah, there were no trees at sea. So uh, <laughs> they had to kind of get creative and come up with their own. <laughs> I love that though. Great question. All right. Now, my friends, 
There were a ton of other celebratory events on board naval ships, though, and most of them included a cake of some sort. So celebrations and their accompanying cakes really brought the entire crew together. They boosted morale and they helped the crew to take their minds off of other difficult aspects of the naval service. A lot of boredom, a lot of monotony. Again, they got bored, came up with these certificates and things, but also a lot of danger and death, too, of their uh, friends. So, for instance, in August 1944, the Intrepid crew gathered to celebrate their very first anniversary of the Intrepid's commissioning. So it was effectively their first birthday. And that year had been really, really difficult for them. They had entered the Pacific War. They had gotten their first battle scars. It was, you know, they lost 30 members of the crew in that first year to combat or other accidents. So they really needed a mor morale booster at the time. And, of course, that called for a really big cake. <laughs> One really big year called for a really, really, really big cake. And you can see that cake right here. So the Intrepid's Bakers did not disappoint. They unveiled this elaborate creation for the first anniversary. It is a two-tiered sheet cake with a cake aircraft carrier built right on top of it. The finished cake weighed over 728 pounds, and it required 90 dozen eggs. And here in this picture, you can see the bakers actually putting some finishing touches on it there with the frosting. So this is such a great picture. Um, and it really shows you that, you know, they wanted to put a lot of work into celebrating this amazing achievement of having, first of all, just created this beautiful ship and then also surviving their first year. Now, likewise, in 1968, the Intrepid was in the Vietnam War and the crew took a break to gather on the flight deck to celebrate its 25th birthday, its 25th commissioning anniversary. And so the ship's bakers again designed this huge, elaborate five layer sheet cake. And they also put, if you see closely there, uh, airplanes on top. And the whole thing together weighed 1400 pounds. So this is a full scale replica that we have on display right now at the ship. Uh, we have an exhibit called Cakes, and it was so big, this cake was, that sailors actually had to move it using a bomb lift. So 1,400 pounds, that's really big. And of course, what took a week to make was polished off by those hungry sailors in just a couple of hours. So imagine being um, one of the bakers working ah, for hours and hours and hours on end to put all these finishing touches, and then boop, just like that, it's gone. Well, that's what happens. <laughs> now, they also found a lot of other things to celebrate to keep their spirits high, too, even just celebrating the little things. Things like keeping a running count of arrested landings. So that is when an airplane's tail hook catches on a steel cable across the flight deck to bring it to a stop. That's just a landing on an aircraft carrier, but they kept track. So in the photo on the right, you can see pilots who were celebrating their 51,000th 51,000 arrested landing on board the Intrepid in 1961. The officers would often call upon the bakers to create cakes uh, just to celebrate little things like that, just the landing milestones. Um, they would often celebrate after every thousand safe landings. So 51,000 is certainly a really, really big deal, calling for a really, really big cake. But as you can imagine, everyone, to, to make a cake that big, for so many people, you're going to need a lot of ingredients. And the Intrepid would leave any port that it visited packed, of course, with enough supplies to sustain 3,000 crew members for very long stretches at sea. And most of the provisions that they had were canned or dried or frozen so that they could uh, have it last as long as possible. And it's actually for that reason that a lot of recipes include non-perishable items. So this is stuff like oil as a, bind a binding agent instead of things like eggs, because of course eggs can go bad. But each Navy recipe was written to feed 100 people, just like this one you can see here. So this is a recipe for easy chocolate cake. It is one of the most uh, popular recipes that they had at the Intrepid. And the cooks would then scale the recipe to feed the crew of their ship, depending on how big it was. So the aircraft carrier, uh, you know, would have a crew of about 3,000 people, which means that the bakers would have to multiply this recipe by 30 to feed the entire crew because it's scaled for 100. So this is a typical cake that they would feed them. But for the holidays, of course, they would use special recipes that called for much, much, much bigger cakes, too. 
Now, we uh, actually have been able to interview some of the former bakers that were on board the ship. And we have these in our oral history collection. And I'm going to share with you right now a uh, short little video of some of these bakers talking about their experiences making these massive, massive cakes. And also just what it was like to be a baker on board the ship in everyday life. So here we go. from the bakery up to the hangar. So, I mean, at one point, they actually made a model of the Intrepid in, in cake. <laughs> so, like I made that carrier cake. It's seven high, and then we start trimming it, and then adding to the top and things like that. It's a very big cake. I ate a very big piece. Uh, We used to average about uh, 50 to 60 cakes for dinner. There was 12 ovens. We had a, a, an 80 quart mixer. We had a fryer for donuts from the chief. He makes the schedule for what we had to make. We get the menu. We get the ingredients. These days, here when I was in the 60s, they kind of used their hands spreading it out. They never used a knife. It's faster easier. The hands are in the dough anyway. We made a peanut butter cake, made a white cake, chocolate cake, carrot cake. Everything that we did is for the guys because they're working hard all over the ship. It was a good experience for me. So there you go, kind of bringing to life what life was like and uh, the experience of some of those bakers. We love to be able to talk to our vets uh, and to learn a little bit about what life was like on board the ship and hear it in their own words too. So our oral history project is amazing. Um, shout out to our, cr our crew members who are doing that now, our staff who are putting those together. And a lot of those are gonna be, um, actually I think they are already on our website, intrepidmuseum.org. So you can feel free to poke around on there and see uh, what some of the other positions also outside of the bakers, what they were up to and uh, hear about their experiences. So the last thing that I want to mention is that, of course, the Intrepid wanted to make the crew feel at home. But sometimes they also had guests on board and they really wanted to make their guests feel special and pull out all of the stops. Now, if you have seen any of our other virtual programs, you might recall that, yes, we are a sea, air and space museum because the Intrepid picked up space capsules back during the space race during the Cold War. Well, the astronauts were kind of like celebrities back then. And every time we picked up an astronaut, it was a huge honor to have them on the ship. So these photos that you can see here are from the Gemini 3 mission in 1965. So of course, once you've retrieved an astronaut or two, how can you make them feel special? Anyone want to take a guess? Bake him a cake, obviously. So here is Gus Grissom and John Young after having splashed down into the Atlantic Ocean after their successful Gemini 3 mission in 1965. And if you look closely, you also might notice what it is that they are cutting that cake with. Do you see that? So a very, very big cake calls for a very, very large knife, of course. And they are actually cutting their Welcome Back to Earth cake with sabers, giant military swords. Makes sense, right? Because, yeah, why not? It's about the length of the cake anyway. Why not? <laughs> what else are you going to use it for? So Navy ships at sea would also, though, host special events 
things like boxing matches uh, and USO shows with concerts and comedians who would come on to help to raise the spirits of everyone on board. And actually on the right, you can see a picture of comedian Bob Hope and performer Anne Margaret from a Christmas USO tour that they did. Uh, this is on another ship that they visited, but there they are standing behind what looks like a giant stack of frosting that is in the shape of a Christmas tree. So yeah, another cake and whew, a whole lot of icing on that one too. So really everyone, if you have learned nothing else today, you can leave here today confidently knowing that sailors liked cake. <laughs> So much so, as I alluded to earlier, that we actually have an entire exhibit about it right now at our museum. So if you are in the neighborhood, our museum did just reopen last week. We would love to have you come and stop by to check out all of the really cool things that we have on display. We are open Thursdays through Sundays from 10 to 5 right now. So please do come on by and check out some of our awesome exhibits, including Navy Cakes, which also includes, that you saw earlier, that full-size replica of the 25th anniversary cake. And there are swords, my friend, too. So definitely come and check it out. So everyone, that brings us to the end of our program for today. And I'm sure you all are so hungry now, like I am after all this discussion of cakes and sweets and breads and all of these things. But before we wrap up, wrap up I do want to see if we have any other questions. So any last questions before we get going? <clears throat> Why do they have swords on a Navy ship? Great question. So to cut the cake, obviously, <laughs> no, no, no. So the military um, actually has sabers as part of their formal uniforms, which sounds kind of silly, but it's a holdover from, you know, the, the long ago olden days when they actually would need blades in order to, you know, help them out on wooden battleships, you know, things like cutting rigging up and stuff like that. Um, but now they're really more just sort of a ceremonial symbol of authority. Um, for the officers. The officers are the ones who had it. Um, so it's, it's again, kind of more of a decoration than anything else. Uh, but there are some really interesting uniform elements in the military like that. For instance, I know in the Army, um, the helicopter pilots actually have spurs on their boots, on their formal regalia. And so you think, okay, why on earth would you need spurs on your shoes to fly a helicopter, right? But again, it's this holdover from way off in the day when the cavalry was actually the cavalry on horseback. So now we don't really use horses in the military anymore. Instead, you know, we have machinery, things like tanks and helicopters, but they're still the same branches and the same units. So there you go. It's kind of like an old fashioned, uh, kind of a little outdated, I suppose. But um, it's, you know, just part of the symbolism, part of the ceremonial traditions, traditions, there you go, um, that they have in the military. So that's why they have swords. <laughs> I know it seems really out there, but, uh, but that's, you know, it's helpful for cutting cakes now. All right. So everyone, if you happen to think of any other questions, you can always reach out to us through our website, intrepidmuseum.org, or also through social media. We also have a short feedback survey that we are going to link to in the chat. So we would love to get your feedback about this program and any of our other programs as well. So if you have a second, please do fill that out for us. And otherwise, I would like to thank you all so much for tuning in today and sharing your comments. Now, uh, I mentioned that the museum has introduced a number of new live streams. So please do follow and subscribe to this channel that you're watching now or visit our website for the latest streaming schedule as well. And our next virtual Intrepid Adventure is going to be on Tuesday, so next week at 3 p.m. And it's going to be Snacking in Space, where we are going to talk even more about food, but from an astronaut's perspective. So what do astronauts eat in space? And what's the deal with astronaut ice cream? Hmm. Tune in on Tuesday and find out. So all right, my friends. So once again, thank you so much for joining us today. And hopefully we will see you online for an upcoming program. See you next time. Bye-bye, everyone.